we have the general what's new in Power BI covering by myself. So the, this will take the first roughly 15, perhaps 20 minutes. And then afterwards, I'm glad to have uh, Abilon here. So Gergely from Abilon and uh, Trivadis or Dennis from Trivadis to talk about two really cool topics. And they will have like, I don't know, 45, 50 minutes perhaps. And as usual, if you have any kind of questions, feel free to drop that in the chat or just interrupt me and we can answer your questions right away. Uh, before we start, as usual, just uh, to raise awareness, our community is growing and growing and we have a French speaking part community, let's say, in Geneva and um, in Lausanne. And if you're interested to join their meetups as well, feel free to reach out to Anne here. Same goes for St. Gallen. Um, there, René is your contact person. How we organize ourselves is, um, for those who don't know, we created or I created a Teams. And if you wish to join, please request to join over this link over here. You will be provided to a form where you have to fill in your name, email address, and agree to uh, that I can use your email address to put you in into Teams. Uh, promise I don't do anything commercial stuff. It's really just that from a Microsoft perspective and data privacy perspective, we're on the safe side. Once you're in Teams, I recommend to access it via browser, so it's easier to switch between the tenants. Uh, this means go to teams.microsoft.com. On the top right corner, choose the Microsoft tenant, and in there you will find the Power BI meetup. Let me show that so that you have an idea how it looks like. So if you're on a Teams website here, you have at the top right corner, you can uh, click on it on your um, on your uh, company name and go to Microsoft. And once you switch the tenant, it takes a few seconds because of authorization and so on. Oh, in my case, I have even to put in my code. Give me a sec for that. <clears throat> but once authorized, I switch the tenant and within the new tenant, you will see the Power BI Meetup channel or teams where you can find all the stuff. Okay. It's coming. Yeah, here it is. <clears throat> and as you see, you ha I have here my team, Power BI user group. This is it, the general channel. Uh, we have here posts at the top. We see the meeting has started right now. I can join directly from here. Or if you go to files within the files section, you will have a structure, each folder for one meetup, and you can find the recording as well, some Power BI samples from myself. So the, all the files that I'm using, I will put them into the folders, folders as well. All right, let me go back then to, to the uh, PowerPoint slides, and let's start with what's new in Power BI. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, these six topics. We have a modern visual tooltip, which is right now in preview. So we modernized that a little bit. Then we announced a new uh, function to backup and restore Power BI data sets, which is pretty cool from my point of view. And we have now Power BI in Jupyter Notebooks available. Going to show that as well. Pretty excited about this. And we announced as well the Deployment Pipelines API, which means, for example, that you can use now Azure DevOps to trigger automatically your deployment pipeline within Power BI. Then we have a new feature from SharePoint, which is to create out of a SharePoint list quickly some Power BI reports. Gonna demo that, of course. And last but not least, we have um, a new function, let's say, to find easier Power BI reports within Teams. So let's start with the first one, the modern visual tooltips. Um, I mean, let me show that live, it's always the easiest if I go to my desktop and if you enable this preview feature and hover over now with a mouse on a visual, you see it takes a second, but then it loads these new buttons here if you have drilled down or drill through enabled on this visual. So instead of, uh, of using here for the drill down option, the top right uh, arrows, I can just click on the drill down here. So let me do that. And if I click on it, you see I will be 
or I'll, I'll go uh, I'll drill down one level down, in this case, Switzerland, and I see all uh, uh, different product categories. Same goes for drill up. So if I go on um, uh, over again, I have now the drill up button, can click to it, and there you go. And of course, same goes for the drill through one. So it's a little bit easier for me or for the end user to go to drill through or to drill down. All right, any questions to that? Pretty obvious one. Yeah, and if you're interested in, in more details, how you can format it and so on, uh, follow here this link and you can find more information about it. Let me move on with the backup and restore of Power BI datasets. Um, this is a new feature, as, as mentioned. There are two things to be considered. First of all, this is a premium feature, which means you need to have either Power BI Premium, Premium per user, or I think Power BI Embedded would also work. It didn't check that, but I guess it, it, it works. Uh, yeah. And secondly, you have to configure your ADLS Gen 2 account to the specific workspace. And keep in mind, this uh, account has to be in the same region like the Power BI tenant. So, the, um, so let me show that again. If I go here to Power BI, this is my premium per user workspace. And on the workspace, if I go to the settings, there it is. I have here Azure connection, and under Azure connection, I can set up a storage. If you do not do so, it's just, let's say, a black box uh, coming from Microsoft, but you can connect to your own storage. And if you set up the Azure Data Lake Gen 2 storage, remember it has to be the same region as, as Power BI, and then you can set it up. If you wish to check where your Power BI region is, just go to, where is it, settings, so settings, it's here, it's about, ah, yeah, here it is, it's about Power BI. If you click on it, you see here, your data is stored in West Central US in my case, so my storage has to be in this region as well. Once you set this up, you have to go over a third party tool because Power BI doesn't offer right now backup and restore through the UI. So this means in my case, I'm gonna connect to this workspace through SQL Server Management Studio. And to do so, again, I can go to settings at the top, I go to premium, and I'm just using this workspace connection. So I can copy it, go to SQL Server Management Studio, say connect to an analysis services, and from here, just uh, put in the server name, which is the workspace URL, and I'm using AAD Universal MFA and putting my email address. And once you did so, you have to sign in, of course. And once you signed in, you are able to browse through your data sets. And now, because I set up everything uh, with the ADLS Gen 2 account, I can right click, for example, on the data set OLS test. And you see I have here backup and restore. And if I click now on backup, looks like my token has expired. So it's again signing in. <clears throat> it's coming, um, but once you wish to back up, you can just choose a uh, name, there it is. So this is the database, I cannot overwrite that, but I can choose a name of my backup file. I can even hit here the browse button, but keep in mind you are browsing in your ADLS Gen 2 account. You cannot browse, for example, and put the, uh, the backup file on your desk. And there it is, so I can I can have like uh, subfolders or, or and so on if you wish. In my case, as you see, I have backup files created. I can do that again and say, okay, test uh, today is the third. There we go. Uh, no uh, overwrite is okay. Apply compression is okay. I don't need to encrypt it. If you wish, you can do so, and just hit okay. And once done, it's saving this back file. And one more time, if I go to the OLS test, if I say now restore, <clears throat> it will be visible. 
Here it is. So again, I just click here the browse button. <clears throat> and I can browse in through my storage account. And now I will be able to see three files. There they are. And this is, oh, I have a typo, I see, but this is the one that I just created. I could select it, hit OK, and then restore image database and hit OK, and then it would be restored. Not going through it, I don't, I don't need to restore it, but this is the process to, to follow. Christian, I have a question. Yes. Please. Uh, can you restore in another workspace? Um, good question. No, because right now uh, you 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 put this uh, storage account to one workspace and then it's bound to this workspace, okay. and therefore you cannot. Uh, if I'm not, and because uh, and if you go and create uh, uh, another connection to a second workspace. In the storage account itself, it will create a subfolder, and you cannot go um, go up this level to create uh, to choose another subfolder. So the best way would be, if you wish to do so, with a workaround, is um, um, create the backup file in the ADLS Gen2, go with the Storage Explorer, um, and copy or, or or extract then the file onto whatever location and copy just to your next location so to the second storage account and then because the file is there you would be able to restore it but not directly from sql server management studio in my case okay thank you does that, does that make sense is it clear yes thank you sure any further questions does it look like so I switch back to the slides and then uh, moving on or last sentence again here is the um, the official uh, post uh, blog post about it there is also a step by step guide and the documentation how you can set up everything that you have at the end uh, the, the right configuration and keep in mind if you didn't set up ADLS gen 2 with the workspace itself and try to back it up your data set you will get an error message like this one which says it's not configured. All right, let's move on with the next one, Power BI in Jupyter Notebooks. Um, this means you can now embed reports, dashboards, even dashboard tiles or, or visuals or the Q&A visual within your Jupyter Notebook. Uh, if, you, if you wish in, to see how it works, again, here is the documentation about it. And the main thing is there is a new Python package or Python library called Power BI Client, and you have to import it and, and work with it. Let me show that as well how it works. I have here in a Visual Studio Code prepared something. Uh, first of all, as you see, um, I'm going to import the Power BI Client and the authentication out of it. So if I run this, takes a few seconds. Then afterwards, I just specify to which workspace ID and which report ID I'm going to use. Oh, I see my kernel connection broke, so I have to give me a second. Just going to reopen Visual Studio in such a case. It's a little bit easier. Sorry for that. Uh, but at the end, you are just specifying the group and report ID. Then I have to authenticate, of course. In my case, I'm going to use a device authentication, but you can also use a master user, uh, uh, service principal user. So there is no issue with that. OK, give me a sec to try to find the right folder. Sorry for that. Here it is. <clears throat> and once it's here, we can follow through. <clears throat> All right, somehow my package doesn't load. In, um, let me move on then with the second feature and I'll try to load it in onto my second screen. OK, I'll come back to that. Sorry for that. I'll, I'll show it then just in another minute. All right, um, <clears throat> moving on. 
deployment pipelines, uh, API, we released it or announced it just a few uh, days ago. As mentioned, this means you can now, uh, through DevOps, for example, automate really the process of the deployment pipelines within Power BI. Uh, for that, again, you will require the XMLA endpoint uh, to be able to, to uh, use the, the deployment pipeline, so therefore Power BI Premium or Premium per user. Uh, you have here a short GIF showing that it works. Right screen is the Azure DevOps, left screen is the deployment pipeline from Power BI. And if you're interested in how to set these things up, here again, a link uh, how to do so. Moving on with the next feature is how you can quickly create reports from a SharePoint list. Um, in the screenshot, you can see it already. We have a button called Integrate. And from there, you can uh, create Power Apps, Flow, uh, Power Apps, Apps, Power Automate flows. And now you can also create automatically a report out of it. Let me show how that looks like. So if I go to SharePoint list, this is our dummy SharePoint list. And I have here the Integrate button. And if I click on it, if I go to Power BI, I see now two things. First of all is demo. This means somebody who has access to the SharePoint list has already created a Power BI report and published it, and it's automatically saved then for others to access it as well. And I have here then the list of all the reports. Or um, if there is something that, that it's not there, not available, or I wish to create my own report, I can just click here to visualize the list. In my case, I go to say visualize the list, and this will take a few seconds to load within Power BI. You see it's opening a new tab, uh, it's opening the Power BI service, and the Power BI service will be automatically connected to the SharePoint list and having uh, one table called Time Tracker because the SharePoint list is also called Time Tracker. Based on the data Power BI founds, finds, it will create an automatic report. As you can see, I have now here like count of duration, um, some, some email address uh, analysis, and so on and so on. And like with Power BI, I can now click here on edit at the top left. Say I wish to switch to edit mode. This is okay for me. And then I can go on and, and yeah, edit the report as I wish. So instead of having here a bar chart, I wish to have perhaps have a line chart for whatever reason. Uh, I can move on, delete something, add new fields on the right hand side. So this is the same experience as it is with Power BI Service because it is Power BI Service. Once you're done, uh, you can go and say you wish to save the file. Once you save it, um, it's not yet published. So this means on the right hand side, you see here this to the list. So you have to first publish really this, this report to the list. And then once you publish it, if I go back to SharePoint, it will be available here below uh, the demo report that we see already. Um, who has access to it? How refresh works? Uh, Power BI is automatically connected to the list as mentioned, and the refresh is automatically uh, scheduled. I'm honestly not sure how much per day it will run because it didn't state it in the document uh, so far. Uh, I'm checking on that. And from a security perspective, technically speaking, um, it's in the my workspace of the SharePoint user. So it's not my user itself. It's like the SharePoint has a technical user and in the behave of this technical user, he has a My Workspace and it's in there. So this means no user can directly access this report. You will also not find it in the powerbi.com. It's really just accessible through the SharePoint list for now. So this means everyone who has access to the SharePoint list here will also see the report, like in my case, the demo one, and will have access to it. Any questions to that, any comments? All right, doesn't look like. So what I'm going to do is, as promised, Visual Studio Code is now here and running. Let me try one more time to show you how it works with Power BI 
client and uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So first of all, in my first command, I'm going to import the libraries. And once they are imported, I set up the workspace ID and the report ID. And once this is done, uh, I can use the device authentication login in my case. So I'm going to do so. If I run it, you see I have now to follow this uh, URL. Switch here to my browser, paste it in there, go back, not here. Just go back and put in this code. Next. But as mentioned, this is really just um, one of the authentication mechanism. You can also use a master uh, user with user and password or a service principle or a token, of course, and work with an embed token, for example. In my case, I now logged in. So let's switch back to Visual Studio Code. You see as well, interactive authentication successfully completed. Once this is done, I call the report object, giving him the group ID, so the workspace ID, the report ID, and my authentication token. And I say, please embed the report in here. And it's loading. And this is really a full experience, like with Power BI everywhere embedded, which means I can switch or I can uh, filter on something. So for example, if I click here on Brazil, it will be filtered, of course, or if I switch here to sales page, I can switch as well. So it's fully interactive. Moving on, what the library gives you as well is you can, of course, specify some uh, meta information, like, for example, the container height and width. So if I run this, you see that the report itself is automatically smaller. You can also go on and say, uh, what kind of filters did I, uh, did I put on the, uh, on the report? Or you can also specify uh, report level filters, for example, if you wish to do so. In my case, I go for the country table on the country column and I put in China. So if I run this, you see in the report itself, it's now everything filtered on China. Or if I wish, I can also um, specify multiple uh, countries. So if I run that again, to scroll up, you see now it's China and USA. So this works. And of course, I can also remove the filters. If I run this code, it's gonna remove the filters and I can see everything again, and so on, and so on. And one perhaps cool, cooler thing is I can also extract data from separate visuals. And how to do so is, for example, first of all, you need to get the page names of the report. So if I uh, run this code, I print out the page names and you see, for example, the name is report section and the display name is sales. So this is the first uh, uh, page here. And we have some meta information. If I move on, we have a second name, report section with a number and the display name is deep dive. So this is this one. And in my case, I go to the deep dive one. So I'm taking uh, this uh, specific name and put it in here as a, as a variable. And then I wish to see all the visuals within, oh, let me switch here. I wish to have all the visuals names on this specific page. So I can run this code again. Once run, I can go on and see, okay, this is the name, the internal name of the visual, which is called revenue by month and customer segment. If I go up again, a little bit bigger, um, this is, if I'm not wrong, this one, revenue by month and customer segment. So this is this type of visual. Sure. I have also the information, what kind of uh, type it is. So line chart makes sense. And again, in my case, I took the pivot table. So uh, taking or taking here the visual name and now, if I export it, if I run this code, I can export really this information out of the table. You see all the data in here. In my case, I'm exporting it specifically from this metrics visual. And because I'm here in Python, for those who are familiar with, I can now uh, work with a Pandas data frame, for example, and, and um, do some stuff with this kind of, of data coming from Power BI directly. All right, two last sentences about the, the Jupyter Notebook is, as mentioned, you can also use other 
uh, authentication mechanism. I'm using here a service principle. This is an example of how you can create with a client a ID secret at the tenant, and then how you can uh, use the token to authenticate. And last but not least, if you do not have a report which you can reuse, uh, feel free to copy paste exactly this code here because this is an open source one. If I run it, you, um, I'm getting the open source report. And then again, if I run um, the, to show the report coming from this request, it's an open source demo report. So you can also play around with it if you wish to do so. You see it's loading, takes a few seconds, and then it will be loaded. I see Luis has his hands up. Do you have a question, Luis? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so my question is a, a little bit, you, you were just mentioning uh, how we could use and test this. Uh, could you share again like uh, wh where um, where you have the code or how can we replicate the, the, the SharePoint mm -hmm. somehow? <laughs> so uh, easiest one is if you follow this link here. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, okay. It, oh no, this is this is SharePoint. Sorry, go back to Jupyter. Where is it here? If you follow this link over here, because it explains exactly how to start with the library and so on, and there is a documentation link, which is a GitHub repo right now, where you can find everything, and as well the demo report I showed the last. Okay. Yeah, does it answer the question or any further questions? Uh, uh, yes, I'm just trying to. Because I, I cannot follow the link right now from the, the screen. I'm trying to take a snapshot and write it afterwards. I copy paste it into the chat. Okay. Yeah. So give me a second, and then it will be in the chat. Any further questions? No, no, that, that was the important one. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right, then we have uh, one last thing. Um, which I have to show, then I'm happy to hand over to Dennis, uh, no, to Gergelis, sorry. Uh, first is we have now, let's say, a new feature to find Power BI reports even easier within Teams. And how that looks like, let me go to my browser and let me, I'm back. Mm -hmm. This is really only in Teams, so you cannot go to PowerBI.com. You have to go to your uh, Teams client or Teams through the browser and open the Power BI app. And once opened, perhaps it's a little bit easier if I switch here. No, it's there. <clears throat> okay, now of course it's the Microsoft one because I changed, so I have to change back to my one. Okay, uh, what I try to show is then once you, you go to the Power BI app, you will see uh, a tab in Teams. And in there, if you click it, you will find all the recent uh, reports that you opened through Teams. So it's a little bit easier if you're working with Teams and sharing through it all your reports, it's easier to find the last one that you opened through it. So now it should be there. So as you see, I have my Power BI app open within Teams, and in there I have here this tab in Teams. And if I click on it, I have now four, the last four reports that I opened, and this is the easiest way uh, to access them so that you know. All right, any questions, anything that I missed or something that I didn't explain very well, feel free to raise them. Um, last or the second last slide is if you're interested in more technical stuff or what we announced or, or showed during build and so on, feel free to follow these links. This is really worth to read if you're interested in. There are some recaps, some really good recaps and so on. And as usual, uh, we will always announce the newest release plan through the second link here, Power Platform Release Plan, or if you wish to have it as a Power BI report, feel free to check out this link. Great, took a little bit longer than expected, but now I'm happy 
to welcome uh, Gergely from Abilon, uh, and I'm happy to, to hand over to you. Thank you, guys. Welcome. Uh, thanks for the oppo opportunity, Christian, that I can have a presentation here. So let me know if you. Oops. All right, Elvis left the building. <laughs> I guess he will rejoin. Um, shall we shall we wait a, a minute? Ah, there he is. Okay. I'm 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 here. I just somehow clicked two times on the leave button instead of the share screen button, <laughs> and I'm oh. sorry for that. No problem. It's, um, can you? We can see your screen. OK, you can see my screen. OK, uh, some, something just changed on the top right corner in Teams. So I'm just not sure, but I was just not sure what is happening. So thank you guys uh, again very much for the opportunity. Uh, my presentation will be about a custom visual called Obilon Map and this story and uh, how it can be used for visualizing things in railways and transportation. Um, can you hear me properly? Yes, I can hear you properly. Yes, good. Perfect. 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 OK, so uh, let me give you a little bit of background about uh, myself and about Tobilon. Um, my name is John Gergely, and uh, actually I started as an ASP.NET developer in my career, but um, somehow I ended up like many other developers in the field of data warehousing and BI. And, um, Abilon that I work for, uh, uh, there's 30 other guys like me who is half a developer, half a data warehousing and BI guy. And um, maybe this uh, this will give you a glimpse why we created Abilon Map, uh, even though we are not a Power BI custom visual making company. We are a consulting company working on projects uh, for Budapest based companies. This is basically our business, but even though we have a couple, couple you know, uh, products or solutions uh, in the fields of BI, and one of them is the is the map-based visualizations. And uh, in most of our projects, uh, we are trying to find problems which cannot be done easily, or it cannot be done at all using um, using Microsoft platform. We are only one. We are only working on Microsoft platform-based projects. We were always working in our professional life. Uh, just with Microsoft technologies, but uh, you know these technologies are on one hand amazing, but there's always you know an opportunity to to extend. Whether it's you know data warehouse automation or planning or forecasting, we have you know we are trying to always to find those problems which are not easy or which are not possible, and uh, uh, this is how basically uh, Abilon Map was uh, Abilon Map was uh, figured out, and this is why we created it. So uh, first of all, uh, we were requested by a railways company that um, you know they have a problem in their data warehousing project, and uh, you know we helped them to fix the solutions, etc. And you know very soon uh, it came up that guys, we love Power BI, but actually we want to see something different. Actually, we want to see our business KPIs. Uh, inside Power BI, which is a tool we love, but please solve it somehow that we can analyze our KPIs using um, uh, our line-based KPIs. And um, actually, what is the solution we created? The solution we created is integrates 100% to Power BI. What you see here, I assume, is Switzerland. Um, this is an amazing country. You need to know our country is very flat, and I'm very jealous for all those mountains. It's um, uh, I never have been to a lot in Switzerland. Always just go through when when to live in your other places. But it's uh, I, I love the mountains, and uh, I always wanted to see you know the the railways there actually. And uh, before this presentation, uh, we and the team just collected some geographical information on the internet to basically see how the railway network of uh, Switzerland would, would, would look like in a map. 
And uh, to explain explain the problem, what you want to solve basically for here, there's a lot of um, you know information in a railways company which cannot be visualized efficiently in a bar chart. So of course we can say you know how many trains are uh, starting from this station or the station or how many passengers or how many delays or how many maintenance works, etc. So it's always possible to visualize something in a bar chart, but especially on physical lines like railways, it's very challenging not to see the problems in a map on a line-based solution. And in Power BI, as of today, there's not a good value proposition for that. Power BI is amazing because it's interactive. You know, I can click on a chart and it will automatically filter the rest of the solution, including our map-based solution. And basically what this information is showing us, it's very easy, we just found this data set on the internet, that basically just show us that uh, how many stations, uh, how many trains, like train line numbers, are going out of Zurich or going through Basel, I mean, uh, starting or ending in uh, Basel, etc. So, you know, if you want to do something like this in Power BI, it's not easy. If you want to do, um, if you want to do other type of analytics, it, it, it's always difficult. And, you know, uh, this is where we started to discover how to create a custom visualizer and, and, and what can we do with that. And uh, let me show you um, show you basically the result. Okay, so let me come back to the presentation. So, uh, as I mentioned, what was in what was in our mind? We wanted to present the business information in a line-based infrastructure where we can basically, based on the KPIs, independently whether it's revenue-based or maintenance-based based or, or, or whatever, we want to see it as lines, as circles of the station, for example, to understand uh, how, for example, the trains are moving, how the passenger, passengers using the railway networks, etc. We have a lot of KPIs like that, which is independent from the map, so I will not talk about it um, in more details. But basically, this is the problems uh, what we wanted to achieve. And, you know, uh, in Power BI, customers can build very sophisticated, very big data sets. And what we understand from railway stations is railways that, you know, the data set size is very huge because, um, you know, most, uh, most of these companies has a very big history regarding measuring the performance of the trains, how the passengers use it, etc. So typically, these data warehouses is complex. If they want to use it uh, together with a mapping solution like Abilon Map, which extends the capabilities of Power BI, what they need to do? Basically, they need two major dimensions. The first dimension is an area dimension, which can be mapped to the physical location. Where are the lines? Where are the stations? How they are organized into business hierarchies like, uh, you know, the regions inside the company, etc., and other uh, type of attributes of, of the lines, whether it's uh, electrified or just regular one. Maybe in Switzerland, everything is elect electrical now. Uh, in Hungary, we still have a very vast amount of lines, which uh, which is unfortunately still uh, using diesel and other diesel as, um, uh, as a source of power, but some electrified lines already exist. And um, of course, we need uh, some additional information for the KPIs. For example, how the traffic looks like there, how the uh, train cancellation, how the punctuality, the delays looks like, etc. So, you know, you can build this type of data set very well in Power BI as of today. And uh, uh, what it will help uh, in this situation is how to put it on a map, basically. And the component that we created is uh, uh, basically, basically it can uh, do two things. It can draw us lines, and the lines can be location-based, where the data set itself contains, uh, for example, where a specific line goes and to where it goes, or it can be references GeoJSON uh, files, which can um, which can create a more sophisticated line of network. I will show it as part of the presentations. And also we can draw circles, which are typically two things, obstacles, if some problem happens, or stations. For example, you know, if we, for example, want to analyze the punctuality, for example, of a train, typically delays can happen because of two things, because it, can know as it cannot go as planned in the lines, 
or the passengers take on takeoff is too slow on the stations. This is the two major region, uh, reasons why the train is uh, not punctual. And, um, uh, and with these capabilities, we will be able to put both the lines and both the stations into the same uh, into the uh, into the same map, which was uh, quite a big challenge actually. And uh, for each of these um, for each of these uh, components, uh, basically you can do the following things. Uh, you can set up colors and sizes, uh, how it should be visualized, whether it should be you know red where the I don't know information is big, the KPI is big, or blue when the where the KPI is low, etc. So uh, this is something. Uh, this is the major information typically customers want to see. And uh, one more thing, uh, typically we need some kind of base map, which is the typical one is OpenStreetMap, which is just uh, free to use in most use cases. But of course, the base maps that you see behind behind the uh, behind the railways, uh, it can be other. Um, uh, other solutions like uh, Macbox or or Carto or etc. When I will show you how to uh, put them behind the scenes, uh, these are typically static maps. It just gives you the context, like you know, like in the previous example, uh, you know, like uh, this is for example from Carto, and this basically behind the lines just shows us uh, how the uh, different uh, regions in Switzerland look like, etc. Et I assume you know much better Switzerland map than I, but I'm I'm starting to learn. Only one thing I discovered: Livigno is here. This is what I know. Uh, and uh, basically, that's it. Okay. So how to basically create a map which looks like uh, which which looks like this? Um, uh, because we didn't have a good data set for uh, Switzerland itself, I will show this. Uh, this is some, you know, very dummy data. This is why um, uh, this is why all the measures here in the the right bottom corner is just random data between, you know, one and one thousand. That's why the buckets look like this. But um, uh, basically, let me show you in a Hungarian example how the uh, operations looks like in a public data set. Actually, it's also a changed data set, but uh, how it looks like in a public data set. Uh, so, um, if we go to a blank page, you know, as always in Power BI, what we will see? Uh, we will see the fields, how, you know, our information looks like. And uh, since it's a custom visual, if you build it, it has a proper uh, logo. But right now, uh, I'm just running it from Visual Studio, so that's why it has a strange icon. But um, basically, this is uh, Abilon Map uh, custom visual. And how it can be used? First of all, it needs an object ID and the object type. This will be the information from the data set. So this is basically the the minimum requirement for this custom, this for the specific custom visuals compared to the data model where we want to see it. Uh, object ID, you can imagine it as the identifier of a station or um, or the identifier of a section of a line. And after that, we need the type itself. So we need to know, you know, if you look back behind the screen, let me just show you as a data table how it looks like. So uh, for rendering the report, we need to know that object number one is a line, object number two is also a line, etc. This because this is how we can map basically this information. This is how we will use this information as part of the map. And after that, uh, what we do is uh, basically very basic. Uh, we will select a KPI, like we have a demo KPI, whether, for example, a traffic is cancelled. Let me put it. We have a lot of different measures. One of them, a set of them, is for specifying where a specific section goes. So if, for example, in the data set we know that a small section in the train, uh, you know, in the railway line from where the line goes to where the line goes we just uh, you know drag it in um, this is how the switzerland map uh, was created this is how we uh, managed to get some public data set but most of the companies has a high precision you know data sets where 
For example, uh, this is one station in Hungary, this is another station in Hungary, and of course, we don't have so big mountains, but still, uh, most of the lines cannot be completely straight. So, um, what we do here, behind the scenes, we can specify a GeoJSON file which describes the information, and inside this GeoJSON file, we need to have an identifier. I will show it a little bit later. And this identifier, will be mapped to this particular property. So this identifier should be the same. And this is why Power BI knows uh, which lines to draw from that GeoJSON files and which, uh, which lines not. And after that, uh, what is happening? Uh, we can specify that uh, we can specify a couple, uh, couple measures. Typically, we have two methods. First of all, we can specify for each object the color and the size, which can be calculated uh, by the tool. In this case, this is a numeric value. So, for example, the number of cancellation, which is the demo data for us uh, in this case. So that's why you will not see any major things here and you know based on that information what we see for example in this demo line you know there was significantly more cancellations in the selected period than in most other lines of the uh, of the railways uh, and uh, secondly uh, we can also create if we want to very precisely specify how the drawing algorithm should should look like we have the option to use uh, direct fields from our data set where both the color and both the size are already pre-calculated. So if we have a very sophisticated KPIs, which is not like doing some linear regressions or something like that, we can use it for um, uh, we can create inside Power BI a specific measure for that or behind the scenes uh, in some analysis services model and just use that calculated KPIs with color to uh, color and sizes to map here. And of course, everywhere, you know, the, this is demo data and everywhere the uh, data sets will show us, um, you know, uh, that we have in this particular case three level of sizes basically and three level of uh, colors and we can see the ratio, which ratios are green, which ratio is uh, red, etc. And inside the tool, we can specify um, inside the format sections how it should look like, how many colors we want to have. We have two options as of now, three or four, five. But of course, it's possible to create uh, additional ones uh, if we use the calculated KPI methodology. And uh, uh, we have the same for sizes. So, for example, we can say that, uh, you know, the shortest lines should be just, uh, I don't know, one pixel. And as you see, it became much, uh, much smaller. Or we can say that, uh, let's go back here to four and the page numbers, uh, this should be like 20. And, uh, you know, in these cases, this became uh, much bigger. It's always depending, you know, on how we would like to visualize our numbers. And of course, we can specify the colors. Uh, so we can say that, you know, the small ones are like, uh, like, uh, like red, the medium ones are like something orange, and the uh, very big KPIs are more like, uh, like reddish. Um, but of course, uh, there's always a possibility to basically specify that we don't want to do a linear calculation, but we want to do some type of manual setting up where we can uh, set up these uh, numbers properly, manually, like, uh, for example, if we have a ratio regarding punctuality, we can say that if punctuality is less than 95%, it should be red. In these cases, we would use the manual one. Or we can use the color scale, then um, the, the, the limits, the number of regions will be not just three region or five region, it will be completely dynamic. So the tool itself tried to create for us something like a heat map on a line map, uh, which basically tries to show us uh, uh, how this information basically uh, basically look like. So uh, this is this is something how uh, how we work uh, basically with this tool. And uh, let me change back the little bit the colors. Okay, number one should be like light blue. Oh, it's not nice. Uh, let me go back to this. Okay, this is better and this will be a stronger color like this dark yellow. Good. 
OK, so the next thing, of course, we have interactivity. So, you know, it's one information that we want to see, you know, our KPIs uh, using, you know, um, uh, using this line based structures and we want to drill in uh, just using, you know, mouse events. Uh, but of course, in some cases, we want to see two tips. Uh, for that, uh, what we can do is basically we just add the tooltip. Basically, we just add the tooltip to the put, 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 tooltip section, which I just oh, it's here, which I just don't see. So if I add the tooltip section, of course, I will see how many cancellations happened here or uh, happened there, and of course. Uh, as for example, in the Switzerland map, we can uh, specify, uh, we can specify uh, like, uh, for example, a specific section from where it go, uh, which line it is, how many this artificial KPI, what we created, etc. So, so this is something uh, you can do. And after that, you know, the second thing that is important in Power BI is the interactivity. We want to create filters, which filters this data. And how to do that? We are just in Power BI, so basically it's very easy. We can create, uh, for example, from the area dimension, we can, uh, uh, from the area dimension, we can have a name like region. And um, regions are the top level regions in, um, in uh, Hungary. And these, uh, basically these regions, let me just put the cancellation next to it. Uh, we can visualize basically it in any way. So this is just, you know, a small map where a small, uh, you know, chart where we will see that, I don't know, in the Budapest region, we have this number of cancellations, etc. And uh, if you select any region, by default, Power BI automatically can filter all the information that we have here. So if we go to Pitch, it's basically Southwest Hungary. If we go to Debrecen, it's uh, Northeast Hungary. So we can see just that part of the region. And of course, depending on their se our settings, all these uh, KPIs will be automatically just adjusted to that particular location. So the map itself is very interactive in terms of uh, if we have other additional filters, charts, diagram as part of our diagram, it's easy to set up. If we check the Switzerland map, this is how we solved, for example, the following question. If we select, for example, a line number that we just want to see line number 100, we will see, you know, the data, which is if uh, we, if the data set is correct, what we download is from the internet, it goes here. If it's uh, line number 610, it uh, goes here. If we want to see which are the lines which ending or starting in Luzern, uh, you know, we can see this part of the map. So it's, you know, it's, it's, e it's easy and nice. But of course, in some cases, we want additional. Uh, and, um, you know, um, uh, and of course, uh, let me just, uh, let me just put, put here a special code. Uh, this this um, cancellation uh, and of course this information shouldn't come uh, just from uh, uh, just from the regional dimension as well. If we had additional data, for example, from companies using the railway stations, etc., we can, for example, to filter to certain companies. And um, if we set up that we don't want to see in this data set actually. Uh, if there was zero cancellations, the data set itself shows us, let me show it to you, the data set itself shows us that there was uh, zero cancellation. So there will be a, a very big uh, number of sets where it will be zero, and that's why the below section starts from zero. But if we change slightly our report to only show us the uh, you know, the sections where the cancellation was greater than zero and the apply a filter, it makes us possible to, for example, analyze this information based on some, this is just randomly generated number, based on some information for, uh, for example, how different uh, railway companies are using the lines, for example, in, in, in cargo. So, 
um, you know, it, it can show us uh, this information as, as well. So, of course, this information shouldn't come just from um, just from uh, geographical dimensions. It can come from other business dimensions like uh, passenger demographics, uh, etc. And uh, let me show you one more thing. Uh, of course, you know, after we created this level of solution, customer said it's very nice, but we want more. We want you to make us possible to basically filter two lines. And what does it mean? Uh, let me just go, to, for example, to Papa. It's a Hungarian settlement and um, we can do the following. Uh, we can select a section of the lines. Oops, we can select. This goes until here. We can select a section of the line and another section of the line. Oops, it's not there. Ah, because there is no line in Hungary. Anyway, this goes here. Oops, let's make it nice. And um, basically what it does, it can automatically filter the other parts of the Power BI report. So if we select just, you know, a small information uh, from the railway cells itself, it can automatically filter to those parts, you know, where uh, this information was selected. Let me just uh, remove this filter. So I will see the uh, all the lines here and let me show this again. So I go to line filtering mode and I'm selecting up, for example, a part of line. And you know, in another part of the country, let me line filtering mode. Let me add another one, like for example, this part of the country, etc. And you know, with this uh, filtering mechanism, you know, we can see that, uh, you know, one of the selected line is the Seged region, the other one is in Sombathe region. And, um, this is a second very interesting things, uh, you know, which uh, was very effective at this particular company to analyze their uh, their business data. Behind the scenes, because in Power BI, what a custom visual gets is basically a table. So what a past, uh, Power BI visual gets is a table. And from a table, actually, how would we know that there's a line here and which stations and which line sections to select? And for this, we need a couple hints to the map. And all these hints are coming through the map properties. And, um, you know, in the map properties, we have some basic information, whether we, for example, want to see a base map. It's not mandatory to have a base map, especially, you know, in cases when we create a map which is not aligned with the uh, geo which is not geographically 100% accurate. Uh, like in metro stations or metro lines, it's very common that we don't have at all a basic map. Uh, basic layer is basically, you know, just um, uh, one static layer which can go through, for example, the country. And all these informations can be specified here. So our base map right now is OpenStreetMap, and you can change it if you have cart or map box or other things. You know, the base map was this, uh, not the basic map, the base map was this yeah the base map was this what was behind the skin the behind the scene and um, and we can specify uh, basically this information this uh, this is that the station layer uh, this station layer basically gives us the metadata it's a geojson file Right now it's published on, on github regarding the Hungarian network but basically it's um, it just uh, gives us the information that uh, if we are in line filtering mode and if we select a station and we select after that another station, uh, it gives us the information how the stations are organized into lines <coughs> and, uh, and makes, uh, makes for us possible to select everything between those, uh, uh, everything between, uh, between those tools. So, uh, if we want to use every part of the solution, uh, we need these basically these two things. First, the good data model, and second, some kind of uh, JSON files which describes the 
describes how the uh, you know how the railways looks like and how the stations connected to each other and after that we can do uh, this type of um, uh, this type of visualization okay this was the second uh, second thing so after this the customer said oh my god uh, really, we don't need to use Tableau anymore because this solution is just as good as uh, as it is. And uh, they asked us a couple other things. Whether it's possible, basically, to create multiple layers, like you know, it's a very typical business scenario that you know checking everything on a very detailed level is nice. But of course, every company, like a railway company, we don't have this information. Didn't found anything regarding this in Switzerland. But um, uh, uh, of course, in some cases, we want to see on top level in all regions. And we want to have some kind of drill down functionality. Like, for example, you know, uh, we, uh, we have three or six major regions inside Hungary. And if I scroll down in my home region, you know, I can see some sub regions here. And after that, I can see the different, you know, stations and uh, different lines. Uh, here how the situation goes. And uh, creating this functionality inside Power BI was everything but easy because the business information on these three levels should be absolutely, you know, uh, in most KPIs, uh, the sum, uh, the value, for example, on regional level, like punctuality, is not a normal sum of the detailed level information. It's not like we are summing up in most KPIs the, the details, but uh, we are basically recalculating it. So basically what we uh, need to have in this case, because in Power BI, as of today, when a developer creates, you know, um, an information when a developer creates uh, a custom visual, basically he or she can just specify one type of query. And um, if we want to create multiple layers, basically what we do, we specify inside the object ID more than one uh, uh, more than one um, information. Let me let me show you uh, if we look into the data itself. So show us table. So if we are the, on the top level, we will see basically region codes. This circle it doesn't mean actually in this case anything. And if I scroll down in any of the regions, I can see a completely different set of lines. And if I scroll down even more, I can see on that particular region the different type of the sections and how the exact details looks like. These identifiers are basically the, the ones that we want to see. And uh, you know, for that, we basically create from these three things a hierarchy and we can specify uh, basically additional uh, additional values additional values for the uh, for the top level values it can be completely different kpis as well so so with this methodology how we can basically create this uh, multi level hierarchy is very easy and uh, for our end users and you know of course uh, using power bi standard navigation um, uh, they can, uh, you know, drill down everywhere in the second level, everywhere in the third level, etc. So basically, from this point of view, it's just uh, standard Power BI usage. Uh, I think uh, uh, this was the toughest part of creating this custom visual that uh, we create this experience for the for the end users how to do it. And the last thing which was interesting for them. Uh, it was, um, you know, in many cases, in many cases, uh, uh, at least we have two lines, you know, in the same physical location. Or even if we have just one line, it's a very, very typical question. How many people, for example, goes towards Budapest, which is our capital, or how many people uh, goes away from Budapest? And the, the, you, you can align this information to any type of KPIs, not just, of course, uh, passenger numbers. So typically, uh, for example, around uh, uh, around power plants and special objects, typically, you know, the cargo trains are going inside taking a very big uh, weight. So, uh, you know, the line itself is used significantly more heavy, 
heavily in one direction and significantly less heavily in the other direction. And how basically this uh, uh, how basically this looks like? How we can how we can do these things? First of all, we need a good. Oops. First of all, uh, the, the Microsoft. Uh, first of all, how this. Um, mm, I have internet and everything is there. Okay, um, I, I cannot show it this way, but basically uh, I don't know why I cannot access that data source anymore, but um, actually what is important there is that uh, inside the map properties, we have some options to uh, basically, if we have more than one direction, we can specify that we want to visualize it and we can set up some type of uh, offset regarding to that. So in these cases, we will not draw the lines into the same location, but we will basically draw the information uh, next to each other. And using this methodology, uh, basically, we are able to create two lines next to uh, next to each other, and I have no idea what's happened here. So let me just refresh my last time. I don't know what's happened. I'm sorry, this demo didn't work. Why I couldn't have access? I can email to myself, which is very convincing, but. No, it does not show anything. Uh, anyway, so this is uh, this is how we can uh, uh, basically basically do this thing. So you know, with um, uh, with basically Abilon Map, we were able to give railways companies, transportation companies, to a tool where uh, standard Power BI uh, users can create additional reports. So. So it's a very, actually it's a very nice functionality, I think. So uh, we can select multiple lines, we can create complex, uh, uh, complex conjunctions, uh, we can create these multiple lines uh, into the same region, but I just uh, uh, created for that. And I think, you know, um, until Microsoft does not solve this type of uh, uh, functionality inside Power BI, there's uh, a need for a tool like, like this map solutions uh, if it comes up. Um, uh, we are not a traditional custom visual making company, so uh, you know if uh, you know. Sorry for this sentence. So you know if you know any customers who might be interested for these solutions, or you want to partner us to to basically give you these solutions, and you can use it in your own projects. Just reach out to us, and I'm very sure we can, you know, make an agreement how how you can use this tool. It's you know, it's possible market size is not too big because it's targeting a very specific uh, uh, scenario. But for those companies who are um, you know in this uh, railways or or um, public transportation in a city or uh, road companies, I think a solution like this is a, is a, uh, is a must. Uh, so guys, thank you very much. And I'm sorry that my last demo didn't work. Maybe something happened with the data source. So basically it says I cannot access the data source. Um, it's not good. Um, so if you have any questions, please let me know. I, I love this tool, so. Unfortunately, I don't see the participant or if anyone's hand is up. If not, then uh, thank you very much for your. Uh, I, uh, I have a question, maybe. Oh, please, please. Uh, exactly on the map that you're showing. Uh, so you, you're showing the areas and you're showing the number. Uh, yes. I was trying to just understand a little bit further than the use case that you described. If it yeah. would also apply, for instance, if I would have to see demographic data around a given area, if, you, like, let's say, 
I want to decide if I open a shop in a given location or not. And I have all the data, demographic data from that area, region, city, uh, city center. So uh, would it be easy to translate that data into the maps that you provide or not? Um, if we get a questions like what you mentioned, we would go with Mapbox because in Mapbox you can create very nice um, inside Power BI with Mapbox. You can create very nice um, uh, demographic level uh, information as well with a good base maps. What you cannot do in Mapbox is that um, you cannot drill down with multiple layers to a line based physical infrastructure. And that's the reason, you know, uh, Mapbox is 100% uh, specialized in mapping solutions. We are just, you know, um, I think a very innovative consulting company, uh, mm -hmm. you know, creating uh, separate things. So we will never compete with Mapbox. Uh, they don't have this particular functionality, which is interesting for transportation companies. So, uh, you know, to be honest, uh, in your solution or in your case, I would use that standard Power BI extensibility, if I can say that. And uh, I would think about these solutions if uh, it's related to some kind of line-based infrastructure where uh, you cannot do this type of experience in, in Mapbox. Okay, thank you very much. I know this is a very edge case, so, you know, yeah. in Hungary we have just a few customers uh, who is, you know, interested in it because, you know, it's not a not a typical things, but you can imagine if you have uh, business data organized next to railway lines, etc. It's um, it's something you need. Okay. okay. Thank you. Great presentation. Uh, guys, thank you very much, and um, and um, and let me give the word back to Christian. Yeah. Thank the next... you very much. Yes, uh, I don't see any further questions. I see Luis has still his hands up, but I guess he, he already uh, questioned uh, what he like to do. Yeah, thanks. So um, I'm always amazed. I mean, you, you mentioned that you can use it for roadways and so on. But yeah. from my point of view, it also works for power grids, for example. So anything that yes. has to do with life. Exactly. Countries. Yeah. yeah. Really nice solution. Thank you very much for the great table. And Thank you very much, guys. Sure. And with that, um, I would like then to hand over to Dennis and his part. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can me? hear you and see you. All right, perfect. Then I will share my screen without uh, pressing leave twice because this happened to me this week also. <laughs> All right. So last question, do you see my screen also? Yes, looks good. All right, perfect. Then I have the honor to talk a little about, about the new composite model in Power BI. And for me, I, I think it's the missing piece between self-service and governed BI. I will do a quick introduction. My name is uh, Dennis Elimovic. I work as a senior consultant at Trivadis. Um, when I don't work at Trivadi, so I also have a Power BI blog. Um, it's called What the Fact BI. And at the moment, as I'm not here from Trivadi, I use the slide set from my blog. And I work since the more or less the release of Power BI uh, with Power BI. So I had a project in 2015, two months after Power BI was released. And the customer wanted to work with Power BI and said we have to really use it. And we didn't have, you know, big idea what it's about, but I'm happy that this uh, happened. So I was uh, at, in the Power BI world since the beginning. I also created, um, together with one colleague at Trivadis, I created a Power BI training. And since this year, we uh, also, together with my colleague, we created a second training that is only about DAX, the programming language of Power BI. In general, when you have questions, just uh, throw them in because uh, I mean, I don't monitor the hands. Maybe Christian, you could do this or just uh, ask the questions because I know after half an hour, most of the questions are uh, gone. So just ask directly if something is not clear. Um, what am I going to tell you? I will, the introduction I already did. 
I will tell a little bit about the current situation, how it works with Power BI, what is self-service, what is Govern BI, and where do we have the gap. I will describe it a little bit, uh, I hope better, in a user scenario. And I also have two demos. Um, I will, will go afterwards in the technical details. So who is not a technical uh, deep dive, uh, who doesn't want a technical deep dive, at this uh, five minutes you have to close your ears. Otherwise, I'm happy to show you uh, what is going on. And then at the end, we have a summary. And uh, yeah, if you have questions at the end, feel free uh, to ask them. But as I already said, also feel free to ask them during the presentation. Current situation with uh, self-service and uh, Govern BI. Self-service at the moment is for me, you have a Power BI or you have a question more or less at the beginning and you want to create a Power BI or self-service report. Usually you can do this by just adding a few data sources. You can add a SQL server, you can add Google Analytics, you can add SharePoint, you can add flat files like CSV or Excel. And this is also one of the biggest strengths of uh, Power BI, that you can really create a huge report, a complex report on uh, all on your own, all by yourself. Um, and yeah, we all did this, I guess, otherwise we wouldn't be in this meeting. Um, and we can share it with others. This is also a little bit uh, the problem when once we created this prototype and uh, imported the data to our file, uh, we do the analysis how we need it. We have just one possibility, and this is to save multiple copies of the file, including the data and including the ETL. So the extraction, the transformation, and the loaded data. And the problem here is that if we have multiple copies, if we do changes, it's a little tough to, to keep up. And usually the reports after a while uh, have different versions and they're heading into different directions. But for self-service, uh, in my opinion, it's perfect to get a prototype or to, to get started until we have the possibility to put the self-service uh, report into a governed mode. What do I mean with governed mode? On one side, we have the Power BI service. What means our self-service report, we can publish it to the Power BI service. And from there, we can do a live connection to the um, data set. Of course, we also have our self-service report. But if we need another version of this report, we can just create a new file and we can connect to the data set of an already existing report. Like this, we have a single data set. We have, if we have changes, if we do a calculation wrong, we can fix it at one point. And all of our uh, reports have automatically the same uh, data. So we don't have to take care that everyone is refreshing and keeping up with the uh, updates. We can do the same with uh, Azure Analysis Service, where it is actually more or less the same like Power BI, and also here we can do a, um, a live connection. Now we have these two worlds, self-service and governed, and in the middle we have a gap, because on one side, on the left side, we can change a lot, but it's hard to maintain, and on the right side, it's hard to change something, but it's easy to maintain. For this, I created an easy explanatory user scenario, where we take our example employee, Bob. This is Bob. Can you see Bob's hand waving, by the way? Yes, you can see that. Great, okay, this is very important for the whole case. So um, Bob attended every Power BI user group meeting uh, in Switzerland, so he knows how to create Power BI reports. And Bob's boss told Bob that he needs uh, to analyze some data uh, from the sales. So what is Bob doing? Bob creates a sales report. The sales report is self-service made. He integrates some SQL Server data and some flat files. And at the end, um, he has exactly what he needs. He saves a few hours every day with his Power BI report. And it's a big, big advantage for his work that he can use Power BI. So as his boss asked um, for this report, Bob is showing it to his boss. His boss is very excited and very happy about his report and also wants to use it and make the whole uh, department to use it. So he shares it with another two employees who are also very happy and excited about Bob's uh, sales report. Now we have uh, many, a few options how we could share the, the report with the employees because when Bob is going 
on holiday, he doesn't have the report on his notebook and his uh, colleagues also have to work with it. The first one is the self-service approach, which means Bob shares a copy with uh, his boss and also with his two employees and they can do their own analysis, they can um, change things. For example, Bob's boss, he realized he needs uh, some more information, so he adds a CSV. Um, the first employee uh, adds some SharePoint data and the sales guy, he adds his Salesforce data. And so we have four different versions of the same report. Um, not all the data is uh, for everyone, so everyone is creating somehow his own change. We have now a problem, for example, when Bob realized he did a mistake at the beginning of his report. So if Bob changes it, he has to somehow inform everyone to also um, change their report to make everything up to date and that everyone has the same data. This in real life, to be honest, doesn't really work. I had a lot of cases where the versions are drifting apart. You cannot really monitor the changes. And at the end, you have this uh, thing where you save a file as new and then more new version one, version one newer and so on. So it's really hard to keep track uh, which file is the newest and which one has the up to date uh, data. So, so for um, this reason, there is a second option. And the second option is to publish it to Power BI service. Um, Bob's boss also can work on Power BI service and he can do a live connection to the data set. He's very happy, and also his two employees. And as Bob realized there is a, a change in the sales report, he can update it to the data set. However, it's difficult to keep everyone um, individual as you cannot change the data in a data set. The data set is online and if you connect live to it, um, you just connect to the existing data set. You cannot add any new um, data to it. Also, if Bob just wants to do a, a small analysis, exactly, a change is technically not possible. So even if Bob is uh, doing a small change just for one report, he wants to quickly add another Excel file, he cannot really do that. He would have to change the whole report and then everyone has to change, but if it's just for him, it's not really a, a good solution. And this is exactly where the Power BI um, composite data model, the new composite data model is uh, arriving because it's taking out this not out of the change is technically not possible. So exactly the right side here that we can change the report is possible. For this, I will take a look in the second scenario. So we have again Bob who created his sales report. The report was published to the Power BI service and Bob's boss uh, wants to connect live to this, um, to this data set. And what does he want to do? He wants to add a CSV file to the existing data set. This is what we can do with a new um, composite data model. So I will uh, open a new Power BI file. Important, this whole um, thing is at the moment in preview. So it's not officially as uh, released as a stable uh, thing, but we can go to the options and in the options under the preview settings, preview features, we have here the direct query for Power BI datasets and analysis service. I have, you have to activate it first, then you have to restart your Power BI file and then you can already get an idea. Um, of what is possible. Also, to be honest, at the moment, you can just use it for Power BI data sets and Azure Analysis Service, but the, uh, Microsoft already announced that it will also come for SQL Server Analysis Service, so on-premises. What do we have now? We want to connect to our uh, online uh, data source, so to on our online data set, so we can connect directly to the data set. I have my sales data set in a Workspace, click on create, and my Power BI is connecting to the data set. Um, a few things happen now. First of all, before we had three tabs here on the left side, this will uh, one will appear soon again, you will see it, but at the moment we just have here the visual. 
the report and we have the data model. On the right side, we see the new columns and on the very bottom, we see we're connected live to a Power BI data set sales in Trivadius, Trivadius Premium Per User workspace. We can take a look at our data model. This is how our data model looks. And we can also do an analysis. So for example, we can just um, go ahead and add from our fact table, for example, my sales amount. Then I want to also uh, do a date, add a date at, on the axis. And I see now my sales per year. I can do all the um, features that we have in Power BI. I can do a drill down for year and month, for example. So let's see how the values are in uh, 2013. This is all possible. This is nothing new until now. So how can I now add an Excel file or a CSV file? Um, we have now, and this is usually doesn't exist, we have to make changes to this data model um, at the bottom. Or if I go to model, we have a new button that is also called make changes to this data model. When I click on it, I get a warning from um, Power BI that it's changing my live connection to a direct query connection. It's direct query, and at the moment we have a live connection. This doesn't sounds a little like the same, but there is a difference. Um, so I will set it to local mode. mode. Uh, then it will take a few seconds, and then our file is changed from a live connection to a direct query connection. Here at the bottom, we see it already. The storage mode is now direct query. Something is wrong with one of our fields. This is the demo feature. So let's add again our date. Where do we have it? Here and ah, yeah, we don't have the hierarchy now. We will uh, do this. Uh, we, we could fix this manually, but I will just let it. It's just that you see that there is data. So what do we have to do now to add a file? We can now in our live connection, we can say get data and add, for example, an Excel file. In our case, we have a budget file. We say open and to our online SS, uh, AS uh, Power BI data set, we can now add an Excel file. The values from an Excel file, I can load it directly or transform the data. What brings me to Power Query? When we open Power Query, uh, like always in a direct query mode, we don't see the native tables. So the only thing we see at the moment is the budget table that we just loaded. And all the other tables are missing. If I click on close and apply, the table will be loaded. It's a potential security risk. Yeah, we get a warning. I'm aware of this. And Power BI is loading the budget file to this um, online Power BI data set. Um, once it's loaded, we will see here again appear the, the middle tab that shows us the data. Because usually in direct query mode, you don't see the data directly because uh, it always sends a query. I can show that now. When we now go to the data, data tab appeared again. I have here my budget table. I can see it and all the tables that are now in direct query mode. It says this table uses direct query and cannot be shown, but we see here we have our budget table. If I go to my data model, also my budget table appears here and we see already we have um, different colors. So for example, my old data model has this blue on top. We have our product table. Um, I will put my fact table down here. And now I can connect my date key. I oh, know I think I need the, the full date alternate key. Hey, what is the date? And can connect it to my budget table. As well as my product key. Can be connected with my product ID. And now I have my budget table connected to my data model. So if we go now to 
this graphic, I will replace quickly the um, the date with the, with the year. And now we have the sales amount. And if I want to compare it to the budget, I can just do it by adding also the budget on top. Um, maybe I shouldn't. Should have done it that way with a line. Um, doesn't really want. But we could show it also by product. So, for example, by product color. And yeah, maybe that was not the right one. And then we see our um, sales versus the budget. So if I'm Bob's boss, I can just go on and I can just uh, to my existing sales dashboard, load my budget that is coming from uh, a normal Excel file or a CSV file or another data source. That's the first uh, case we can do. Is it until now clear? Do you have any questions? I don't see any questions so far in the chat. All right, then I will just continue. Um, so what did we do? We connected our Power BI file to our data set and added an Excel file with a budget and have now a combined data set. This is what we did. Another case that we have is that Bob just doesn't uh, only have the sales report. He also has the inventory report. Maybe the warehouse did the inventory report, but Bob's boss wants him to compare the sales, um, the current sales with the inventory that we have on stock. And they are both already existing reports with existing data sets. I mean, now we just have an Excel or a CSV that we had to add. And now we have to um, add a whole um, file. So how does it work? We can load both in Power BI services. So the inventory and also the sales report. And what we have to do now is again to create a file. And we connect live to the Power BI service to the sales report. But in addition, we can also connect live to a second data set. So we're not limited anymore to only one data set. We can combine as many data sets as we want and still import flat files. For example, like the CSV, like the budget we just had. So if I take my file now, I want to add another Power BI data set. And this time the inventory. I click on create. Connecting to the Power BI service and loading the second data model to my current table, to my current Power BI file. Actually, it's not loading any data, it's just establishing the connection because, uh, as we already said, it's a live connection or a direct query it used to be, what means we have the files online and we just want to um, show the results here. So, this is done. We see here a second data set. In this case, it's a dark blue. So also from the colors, we can uh, see a difference between the two data sets. One is a bright blue, one is dark blue, and flat tables are without any color. So we can see what belongs uh, to which exact uh, data set. But now we have to connect them. Um, as we have the, here we have the inventory. This is my fact. Now this is my, product inventory and it's the, down there is the fake table. Dennis, just, yeah. just quickly, I see a question from Ignacio. Yes. Sure. Uh, hello. Yourself. <laughs> hello, Dennis, yes. Uh, my question is related with the um, live connection in analysis services. So um, in, imagine in my case, we have a group of users from which we would like only to access the cube and we would prevent uh, yeah, prevent them to to add uh, more data. Then we will have to use the live connection instead of the direct query. I mean, when you do a, when you do a live connection anyway, um, you can add the role level security. So the user is always connected with his uh, user okay. account. 
So in this case, everyone would just see whatever he's allowed to see because the user uh, who is opening the report, his credentials will be passed. And if he doesn't have any access, he will not see anything. Okay, but and but uh, is it possible as an admin to just enable this feature for some of the users? No, this is a, a at the okay. moment it's in preview, but it's in Power BI Desktop. But um, to be honest, you know you cannot really prevent that because the if the user has access to both to both reports and both data sets, he yeah, anyway okay. sees both data. So he, uh, he has just a, a possibility to combine them. And otherwise, he wouldn't have. I mean, he would open them uh, manually and then uh, have to write uh, the, the numbers ah, out. Okay. And, you know, it's a okay, little yeah, harder, but it's just easier. Yeah. If he has access to the data sets, then he has the possibility of doing this. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Thanks a lot, Dennis. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, yeah, we have the we have the tables here. So here's our fact table, and now we have the the issue or the problem. We have, for example, two product tables and two date tables. Now, how can we do it that we filter the sales and the inventory at the same time? Because either I filter by product sales or I, um, sorry, by product from the sales table or by the product by the, from the inventory table. And this we can also solve here in Power BI. We just have to put one table above, a date table or a product table that is filtering both tables of course, these ones we would hide. And then with uh, this table, we can filter both models at the same time. And that's what we're going to do. Sadly, this is not possible in the relationship tab, so we have to go here. We say we want to create a new table with that. We say dim prod equals, and then we will do a union of both tables. So on one side on the product inventory and on the product sales product tables. When we do this, we get uh, one table that contains all the values, but as you already can mention, I think a lot of the products will be the same. So we will have duplicates here. Yeah, we see them already here. It starts again at one. And this is not what we want here, adjustable rays, so we have to get rid of the duplicates. For this, we can use the distinct function. Let's format it a little. Use the union, this table, and this table. Close the union again, and close the distinct. And like this, we have one product table that should have all the values from both tables once. This table we can now use to filter both. So we can put this above. We can take the product product key and filter the first product table. We should do it a uh, one to many table and want to filter single direction. The same we will do with the second table. Also one to many and a single direction. And we can filter now also the other side. What is now a little confusing for the end user is that we would have three uh, product tables, so we will just hide these two from the end user. So we just have one product table, and this product table is filtering both, um, both tables. Uh, here it's hidden, so we will remove the product color from here and we will add it from our new table and we should get the same results. We can also use that as a filter, for example, I don't know, product category, and we can filter our table on different areas. Um, I will quickly do the same for the date table. So I will add a new table and we'll call it Dim date equals distinct union dim date inventory and dim date sales. And we have a second date table. 
now I will add this also to the or to the relationships in the model. Um, so we can add the date, connect the date key with the date key. Yes, uh, one to many relationship in one direction. And the same for the second uh, table, date table. Also one to many and single direction. And then we have everything connected. We have now the data of uh, two different data sets and one Excel file connected in Power BI. And we did the connection between these two data models with two calculated um, date, uh, with two calculated tables. I think I have to hide my date tables and then we're good to go. And let's change this a little. Um, maybe we should get something with a date so we can add instead of the color our hierarchy, the quarters I don't want. And now let's also add something from our um, inventory. What should we take? I think the, the balance probably. Take this as a column. No, this was the wrong field. The line is probably better. And then we get our inventory versus our sales in one report. So if we do, drill, uh, do a drill down, we see how our sales are going up and down and also our inventory. So here we sold a little more. What means then we had to buy a little more inventory that uh, our inventory was going up. Then we had a kind of stable and here at the end towards Christmas, we increased again our inventory that it matches our sales. We can continue with this, could also go down by day and so on. Um, yeah, you see here on one day we sold quite a lot, so it was going, I'm happy this matches also. <laughs> so on one day here it was a lot sold, so the inventory went down. And like this, I could solve my problem with already existing techniques. So what I did now, or what we did now, let's uh, go through. We used our already two existing re reports, one the inventory and one the sales report that we have in our Power BI services. And we could add both of them to one report, combine it with the budget. I didn't show it now, but it's uh, the same like from the first case. And we can could now do a report where we have everything integrated. The inventory data from Power BI, the sales data from Power BI, and the flat file in a new file without doing much work. Everyone is happy. Bob is happy. His boss is happy because we can now do self-service based on Govern BI. We have all the advantages of self-service, and on the other side, we have all the advantages of a Govern BI. And in my opinion, this is a really, really big thing. Um, in my daily work, I see cases like this every day where you have to do a trade-off. What should I do? Either this or that. And this for me is a really big thing because it, it gives such a big advantage in so many cases. Good. Are there any questions? Then I will continue. Now I will tell it a little more technical. So until uh, so, if you're not very technical, just just uh, slip the next five minutes, and um, otherwise I, I will go a little deeper. So we have uh, at the moment we had different ways to work with Power BI, like we could import the data. We had the live uh, mode or enterprise mode and the direct query, and this is now what we did now. The uh, new uh, version is the direct query for Power BI data sets and analysis service. Now you also know then soon why the name is so complex or long. What we had first was the, um, the import mode. I separated here be between cloud and on-premises. We have our Power BI file on our notebook with fully functioning Power Query and our data model, everything inside the Power BI files. We have some offline data sources, SQL Server, Excel, CSV. We have some online data sources. And what we do in the import mode, we import the data. 
physically into the um, into the file. So all the data is really in the PBIX file. This we can publish to the Power BI service. And if we want to refresh, the online sources can, can be refreshed directly. The offline sources, we need the Power BI on-premise data gateway. This just to, to make it complete. Now we talk about the two differences that we have. The next one was the live mode or enterprise mode. And the big difference is the following. We have our whole um, data model we put in our analysis service, including Power Query and including the data model. So Power BI itself is just a tool to visualize. It doesn't contain any data. The data will be imported to our analysis service and Power BI is doing a live connection to this analysis service. And important because I don't have the data model anymore in my file, there can always just be one data model. What was the big difference between live mode and uh, direct query mode? We have now our whole data model here. Everything is important here and Power BI can just do a live connection to get the values from the analysis service. If we upload it again, it's, uh, we publish it again, and then the, if, if we browse a report, it's again going live to our analysis service. This whole thing is also, of course, possible in the cloud with Azure Analysis Service. Now, what was possible until now was direct query, and the difference to the, I will go one back, the difference to the live mode is in analysis service, we had the whole logic, Power Query, and the data model. In direct query mode, we have the logic in the Power BI file. For relational databases, we can still do a live connection to on-premise and in the cloud relational databases. And at the same time, I can still import data. But this was just possible with relational databases. It had a few disadvantages. For example, when every click I do, it sends a query to my SQL server, and then it has to return uh, to the query. And then after, I don't know, 10, 20 seconds, the query is coming back, it's really slow and it's a huge load for the data source. So these I would usually not recommend for that reason, just in a few specific cases, but this is how it worked until now. We can publish again the, the report to Power BI and yeah, when, when we browse the report, it's also going live to the data sources and the ones that I imported are still in the file. And now this is the new thing. It's a mix um, a little bit of direct query and uh, live data. So it's just another data source, let's say, for direct query is now analysis service and at the same time also Power BI data sets. So analysis service and Power BI data sets are here more or less the same. We have our Power BI file again with Power Query inside and the data model inside. What we can do now, what we just did in this case, is we do a live connection to an analysis service model or an online Power BI data set. We can, this is the amazing thing, we can do this not only with one um, data source like we used to do, we can also do it with multiple like we did now. And even better, we can still import files at the same time to mix up the different data sources. And we can also connect live to the relational databases. And not just live, what can we also do? We can still also just import the data. So we are super flexible. We can go live on cubes, on analysis service or Power BI datasets. We can go live on rela relational databases and we can also import them. We could in theory also import data from analysis service, but I would not recommend that. And we can still import the flat files that we have or other services like uh, Google Analytics, Salesforce or whatever you can, you, you name it. You have now with a new technology, you have the full uh, flexibility for everything. Good, let's come to a summary. What can we do with a new um, data model with a direct query for uh, Power BI and SSAS? They are perfect to do self-service on a governance data set. This is exactly what we do. We have one data set that someone is taking care of that is online, and still we have the full flexibility of self-service. It's really closing the gap between self-service and Govern BI because it's combining both of them. You can mix all data sources that 
is possible um, at the moment with a few limitations still, but it's in preview and things will change. But you can go live to data sources and you can import data sources all at the same time. It's, in my opinion, perfect for ad hoc reporting, like uh, when you just quickly have to, like we had now, um, add the inventory for a uh, to get some information, but you don't want to spend uh, or start a whole procedure to change this data set. You can just quickly take your existing data set and join your data that you want to this um, data set. And the disadvantages uh, at the moment, I said it already, it's in preview. So it might be a little buggy, uh, although I have the feeling it's kind of stable, but I've seen in the, in the Power BI community a few people who uh, had issues but it's in preview, so uh, this is to be expected. And at the moment, it's limited to Power BI dataset and Azure Analysis Service, although Microsoft already announced that they plan to include it in the next SQL Server update. So also for the SSAS on-prem, um, it would be available. Good. That was it from my side. From the presentation. Um, do you have any questions or is there something unclear or clear or feedback or feel free? I don't see any hand raised or any questions in the chat. It looks like everything is clear. All right. All right then. Thank you very much, Dennis. Really great demo. Really, really great from my point of view. This new update, uh, as you mentioned, the combination of self-service and Govern BI is now fully there. Uh, so then let me take over the screen one more time. There it is. <clears throat> Close up the call. And for those who don't remember, as mentioned, uh, we will run the meetups monthly. We started this in April and since then, since then it's always the first Thursday of the month uh, from 4 till 6 p.m. Swiss time. The next one is therefore on the 1st of July and we have two speakers. The first one will be in German. This is Catherine from Germany. She will talk about uh, full power, let's say, of Power BI, Power Automate, and Power Apps. And we have as well Mark. He is a Power BI guru, and I'm really happy to see him in our next call. He will talk a little bit about the enterprise and multi-tier Power BI deployments with Azure DevOps. I'm sure he's also excited about the new API capabilities, which we will we'll see next time. Um, stay tuned. Go to the aks.ms slash PBI meetup website. You can find every event over there and useful links at the end. If you want to join again, this is the link to it, which will open up forms. If you want to join the calls directly, this is the link to it as well. And last but not least, the website meetup. I added the last slide with some useful Power BI resources for those who are interested in. And if there are no other questions, I would like to thank everyone for attending. Even if the weather is so nice, I hope that you can enjoy now the, the, the last few hours of it, of your evening, and hope to see you soon. I'll stay for the next two or three minutes. Perhaps if you have any further questions, uh, so we can answer that. It doesn't have to be about the session. You can also raise your, any other question if you have so. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks everyone, have a great evening. Christian, uh, I'm Luis, one question. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just noticed that there's a, on the participants, some of them don't have access to the, to the chat, including myself. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because they are as guests, uh, mm -hmm. could you clarify a little bit of the participation on the the, the meetup group? Mm -hmm. So, let me go back. Oh, I forgot something, and Dennis moved now away. I even prepared it. Uh, 
Dennis has a cool website. Yes, probably I read. Ah, oh, you still there? I sorry, I totally forget it. You see, I prepared this uh, before I answer your question, Luis. Just give okay, me one, one second. <laughs> um, Dennis created a very nice report about uh, vaccination status here in Switzerland. So if you want to see it, go to impfstand.ch. You see the website over here. I put it as well in the chat, and uh, you can check how the current status is in each. Uh, Canton, and you can yeah do some further analysis. Pretty nice report from my point of view. And you can switch at the top as well to see a second page of the report. And okay. I plan to do it in English on the weekend also. So there will be two languages available from right. next week. I guess. Uh, I hear that you have no lives and so working on Power BI reports, which is also good. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just kidding, of course. So, okay, Luis. Coming back to your question, um, usually this is something that I, I can't do anything about because <clears throat> we from Microsoft side where I created the teams, um, we allow guest users to access the files, which means if you don't see it, your company doesn't allow you access to um, files in a guest tenant. So if I go back here to teams, and you cannot see here the files, this means the policy is blocking it from here. I mean, in my case, I'm also in my demo environment, which is a uh, kbubalo.com, and I can access it as a guest user as well. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, so we need to basically, because I'm on my demo, on my developer as well, so I need to see it on my end, what, what is preventing mm -hmm. me to to access files from your side, is that it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay I'll give it a try. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Any anything else? Any other question? All right, doesn't look like then with that one more time. Thank the speakers for being here today and doing such a great demo and thanks everyone for attending. And then I'm going to close the call and hopefully we see us next month. Have a nice evening. Bye everyone. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Have a nice evening. Thank bye bye. You. bye, -bye. Cheers.